Wherever you are on your leadership voyage, it starts here. Welcome to Leadership Voyage, the podcast dedicated to your pursuit of becoming a great leader. My name is Jason Wick, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 9. This episode is like none other that we have had as long as this show has been around going back to January of 2022. I highly encourage you to stick around to listen to my discussion with Brian Slade. Before we get into some of the details about that discussion, I want to remind you all about Instacart. Uh, I don't know about you all. We were fortunate enough in my family to uh, get away to somewhere a little warmer for the spring break a little while ago, earlier this month. And when we came back, our trip was just long enough that we did not have anything perishable that was in a good, good shape. So... It was a great time to use Instacart, which we did. As a reminder, if you follow the link in the show notes, it lets Instacart know that we sent you and helps support helps support our show. What is Instacart if you don't know about it? It is a grocery delivery service, hand-selected groceries by shoppers based on your preferences. They uh, get the products that you love from local stores. You can shop from multiple stores in a single order. Instacart highlights deals to help you save money, and uh, they find everything you usually buy. Click on that link in the show notes, wherever you came from, to listen to Leadership Voyage, and check out Instacart. You get free delivery on your very first grocery order over $35. You can contact me, Jason Wick, at startyourvoyage at gmail.com. The show's website is leadership.voyage, and if there is one one little thing you could do if you are listening, it is to subscribe. And if you have been a listener, to go ahead and rate and review. It helps others see the show and brings awareness to it, which will help others with their leadership voyages as well. So Brian Slade wrote a book called Cleared Hot, which is a military term. You'll learn more about it. He served in Afghanistan in the 2000s and also Uh, served several other tours of duty. But in the book, Cleared Hot, it it addresses pretty much a 23-month period of when he served. There is a lot to learn from Brian's journey. After he got back and kind of thought about why did the trauma that he experienced lead to growth for him, whereas many others that he served with, that trauma led to damage. And he explored that question. And from talking to professionals, he came up with seven principles that are essentially the reasons that he was able to grow from trauma rather than be damaged by it uh, on the whole. And we talk about those seven principles as well as the stories in the book. If you're not into military stuff, this is the first time we've ever had someone explicitly talking about uh, war and uh, military on this this show, Uh, but boy, there is a lot to learn from it. It is a fascinating discussion with Brian. He handles serious topics with tremendous levity. His writing reflects that. His storytelling reflects that. And I do believe that if you're open to the concepts that Brian sets forth, any one of us can grow to a tremendous degree and presumably based on what he has learned, can set ourselves up to grow from trauma rather than be damaged. Have a listen. See what you think on this latest episode of Leadership Voyage with Brian Slade. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Leadership Voyage. I am here with Brian Slade. Brian, it's great to meet you this morning. Jason, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. We're here to talk uh, about your book from late last year, 2022, 
uh, which might have the title, might win an award for uh, the longest and coolest subtitle. So here's the title of the book. <laughs> it is Cleared Hot, Lessons Learned About Life, Love, and Leadership While Flying the Apache Gunship in Afghanistan and Why I Believe a Prepared Mind Can Help Minimize PTSD. And you co-authored that with Michael Hirsch. What does cleared hot mean? Uh, I'm curious, first of all, for our listeners. Yeah, so anybody that's military background will know exactly what that means right off the bat. But it, and when I when I pick, picked the name, and there was some thought process that went into it. But one thing that I didn't realize is that is just not an obvious name for, for civilians, which is fine because it that begs this question, right, that you're asking. Um, cleared hot is a directive that you're given in the military when you've met all the criteria necessary to move forth and proceed with um, lethal force, right? So we obviously want to minimize collateral damage. We want to we want to maximize um, impact on the enemy, and you know to do that we we there are certain criteria rules of engagement that we fall into. But the reason I picked it for the name of this book is because the book is 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 insidiously teaching lessons to, to people to help them realize that they are cleared hot on their life. Right. Mm. You have met the criteria to move forth with decisive uh, action. You don't need to be sitting back. And if and if you feel you haven't, you, you need to like look and identify where you have and move forward. Right. That's what that's why we picked Clear Hot. Love that title. And thanks for the explanation and uh, a great lesson already. I, I feel we're going to get in an uh, in empowerment and taking action in your own life, which is wonderful to hear. Uh, just on the book first, I wanted to say that I really enjoyed the voice that you and and your co-author, Michael, worked out. Um, I wanted to give folks a little example of this. I, I'm not an audiobook reader, but I will do the best I can. There's a paragraph in the uh, last fourth of the book about, from my perception, really one of the most intense moments in the book where your co-pilot has actually been shot in the leg from below you all in a helicopter. And I wanted to give people an example of how you're able to thread the needle of an intense moment, but you still find this levity and, and almost humor in, in the writing. So, so here it is. Throughout all this, Otto hasn't stopped screaming, ah, oh, damn it, my leg, oh God. My mind's trifurcated, if that's a thing. One part needs to communicate with our wingman, another with my co-pilot, and the third has to remember everything I was taught and have since learned about what keeps a damaged AH-64 in the air. Keep the spinny thing spinny. Try patting your head and rubbing your belly while explaining what you're doing to two different people on opposite sides of the room, all while bad guys are firing rounds at you. That passage, I'll be honest with you, as a, as a civilian reading through this book, sometimes I felt like I lost sight <laughs> of the seriousness of what's going on in these things, because your inner dialogue is coming across in a way that just provides this balance in these situations. I'm curious, is the writing a reflection of kind of how your mindset is, how your mind works, or I'm just curious, any insight? Uh, it 100% is. Everybody that's met me and knows me is like, dude, your book is just how you talk, and it's how it's who and how you how you are. And, and one of the principles that we identified in the book as far as a, a a resilience mindset um, when you when you're faced with obstacles and traumatic events and all these type of things is to find the levity, is to find the light side of what is <laughs> seems like a very dark situation. And I don't know if you listen to the gun tape, the gun video, where he's yeah, the immediacy of what happens is screaming, the engines shot out, the flight controls are jammed. It's a big, it's a it's it's an intense moment. As soon as we are moving forward, obviously we're still intense, but you hear even my co-pilot who's wounded crack a joke. Then you hear me trying to lighten it up and crack crack jokes. We don't know if he's going to die, but that's literally one of the coping mechanisms that a lot of people um, learn in, the, in, in those types of situations. But that's absolutely applicable to everyday life. I mean, how many times do we just get inundated with like relationship stuff, right? And it just seems like it's the it's it's burying you, right? And you and you and it's so serious. It's so serious. But mm. at the end of the day, it's as serious as we want to make it, right? It's as serious as the power that we give it. And and if we can start to just stand and be like, I can't believe I'm this dumb sometimes, you know? And laugh <laughs> at you. Yeah, thanks. Great for pointing that out. And we're gonna get into a lot of the 
the lessons learned. And, and personally, I'm a, a big fan of kind of everything can be related, right? And, and even though this book is about your experience uh, in about a roughly about a two year period, I believe, right, um, in, in Afghanistan, but essentially there's so much that we all could apply to our own self-improvement, our own handling of situations at work, whatever it is. Now, before we get into a bunch of those great things, uh, I did want to ask you a little bit more about the book specifically. Um, first off, what inspired you to write this book, Brian? Really, it came down to disparity of opportunity, meaning I had the opportunity to experience all these great, wait, maybe you call them horrific, whatever you want to call them, it, significant experiences and learn from them and grow from them, experience PTSG, post-traumatic stress growth, right, versus damage. And and I really kind of felt like all those lessons were <laughs> being taken for granted if they're just used on me. If it's just me that benefits for it, benefits, it seems like excessive or disparity of opportunity is as, as, as I, I had the opportunity. It shouldn't just be me. It should be, it should be an opportunity for anybody who's willing to like jump in with me and see what happened and how, and then like you said, and I think this is key, see how it applies in their own lives because it really does. It really does apply in, I would say everybody's life to some degree and some people's lives very much so, right? And we try to do that in the book and tie back to, you know, normal. <laughs> what, what's normal, right? Yeah, what is normal? Yeah, tie back to life, we'll just say. No, that, thank you. And and you do use uh, this phrase somewhere uh, in the book, either towards the end or throughout, that there are these elements, these principles that help folks can help or can use to apply to their own lives. And I think the phrase you use is, to prepare for your Afghanistan, talking to the reader. In other words, we have trauma. We we have we will likely have trauma, and and hopefully some of these principles can help with the Teflon coating, uh, as you've put it in the book. One last question about the the book itself, the authoring of the book. Uh, I heard an interview with you. I don't remember when it was. I listened to it a few weeks back. Uh, you and your co-author, and you you call out how different you are. I believe you said something like. Uh, you were uh, a conservative Mormon and Michael is something else. I don't remember exactly what it was, but liberal I'm curious. <laughs> there it is, a liberal Jewish guy. And so what I'm wondering is, what are the value that you get from diversity? Uh, what's the value you get from working with people who are different from well, you? Well, <laughs> so first of all, Mike's an amazing guy, right? He's from a different generation. He's 70 something years old. He fought, he fought in Vietnam, okay? So there's a lot of reasons why he made sense to me. Um, I put this out to several authors uh, and said, hey, are you interested? They all said yes, right? Um, one of them was uh, the author of American Sniper. It's got something, you know, like, these are known authors that were interested. I, you know, I was kind of debating back and forth who I wanted to go to, go with. But when Mike, one, he was persistent. Mike was persistent. <laughs> But which tells me something about him, right? That if he's persistent here, he will get us through this thing, right? We will get through this, right? So that that made some that made that had some value. But then when I got to know the guy, he's from this other war that's similar to Afghanistan, but different in many ways too. A different generation, similar in why are we still here? You know, similar. Yeah, sure. Did we come here for the right reason? Different in that when he came back, they spit at him. Yeah. You know, and, and when I came back, they, they gave me candy. Right. So very, very different. And I'm grateful for that. I am so grateful that we have a country that is very diverse in their perspectives, but still supports the military, not unanimously, but very, very well. And then as I got to know him and I was like, holy crap, we are so polarized in a lot of ways. I mean, he's very liberal. I'm pretty conservative. Like I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not registered as a Republican or a Democrat. I just, I'm, I call myself a capitalist. Mike has a little different perspective. And, and what makes our country great, and, I, and this is something I just want to get, get across to as many people as possible, we are different. That's good. That's good. Concrete only works as a mixture for a foundation. Hmm. If you have the concrete powder, you are not putting a house on that. If you have sand, you aren't putting a house on that. You have rock, yeah, maybe for a little bit, but it's still not going to sit there. It's not going to be congealed together. You mix all that stuff together with water, 
And now you have a foundation and that's diversity. That's what diversity can do, right? So we are different, celebrate those differences, use those differences, mix those differences, create a foundation. And that's what I saw in Mike. Yeah, thanks for the answer. And thanks for the uh, the metaphor, the concrete as well. You know, and, and even from a business angle, um, you know, when you see companies that are more diverse or their boards are more diverse, however you look at those those measurements, you know, in general, they, they outperform uh, other companies. There's a, a tremendous value to having the, the differences from not a coincidence, us. not a coincidence. Yeah. Okay. One of the topics I'm really looking forward to talking about is teams. You talk about teams at a, a variety of levels, some of which I can understand personally, some of which I cannot. Uh, you talk about when you played football in high school, um, how you ended up playing football in college, but it was a little different uh, in the military. You have teams. I don't know the terminology, whether it's units or, or what have you, but when you look at teams, how is sports in the military similar or different? A lot of the lessons that I learned in sports um, were, were applied not just in the military, but throughout my life. I, and educators don't like to hear me say this, but um, I learned more from on how to attack life and, and succeed in life through sports than I did any classroom. So, um, and and that's that's me. You know, we all have our own unique um affinity for whatever right whether it's a sport or whether it's playing the violin or whether it's music or whether it's well i guess violin and music same thing but whether it's something you know if we dive into it we're going to learn especially if there's other people involved which i really do think that it that 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 matters even in wrestling which is like very out there and you're exposed you're still part of a team well here's the similarities you got to work together to achieve a common cause and you have to have a mission statement a vision and everybody has their duties and if you, if one guy slacks on his duty, somebody else is going to have to pick up the slack, and that's just not what you want. So there's got to be a synergy of effort. That's the similarities, right? Differences is you don't die very often in football. Um, there's not bullets coming at you. Things aren't exploding around you. So those are different, right? But other than that, really, you are a camaraderie-based, move forward and conquer entity. It's very, very similar, and. Uh, a lot of the the feelings of brotherhood and and whatever you want to call it um, that you foster in sports, you definitely foster in the military. If you're in a successful unit, you foster that as well. You said the word camaraderie. Uh, you've had a lot of different roles. Uh, well, in the book, you had a couple different roles within the military and presumably well beyond that in, in your career that you've had going on 20 something years at this point, right? Um, <laughs> but, but who's counting? Yeah. Uh, is there anything more important than camaraderie when it comes to building a team from your point of view? Yeah, I, I said this in the book, right? I loved football. I loved, loved, loved. I mean, like, just loved it. Like, I dream about it. I would, you know, it was just so much fun for me. And then I played it in college. And it took out one piece, one piece of football, and it was camaraderie, right? And it killed it for me. So did I really love football? Or did I love that connection that I felt through football? I, I actually played, I didn't put this in the book, but I actually played football again as a 40-year-old in a semi-pro league. Yeah, and and there was a little bit more of that camaraderie again, and it was fun. And it was, you know, I was a little bit too old to be playing the game because I was in Epsom Salt for a week after the game. But Okay, right. <laughs> but the camaraderie was there, and that's what I want. I kind of wanted to see. I kind of wanted to see, look, I, do I still love this game? Or, or was it really just the the camaraderie and and it's both but if you take out camaraderie it's not the same right so it, it is a very key element i would say it's the water to your concrete for those listening here and, and you just heard brian say at 40 years old he went back and played football and, and he wanted to see he said you wanted to see i think that phrase is a really interesting one learning is a constant thread in your book each chapter has a, a pretty descriptive name. And as per the previous uh, snippet I, I read, usually maybe something a little, little funny, uh, but, it, but it's, it's amazing how you kind of have a lesson in every chapter, whether it's, you know, watching your overconfidence or other things. Um, boy, you are focused on learning, Brian. How does someone go about being an effective learner? Or how have you gone about being an effective learner? What does it take? <laughs> well, first, 
I don't know if I'm an effective learner. I've learned. Okay, that's fair. Thank you, you know, uh, yeah, I've fair. learned that sometimes not effectively. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the biggest, the biggest, the big, the easiest way to learn is to look for it, to pay attention, right? To to do a little self analysis at the end of each day and be like, holy shit, this just happened. What, what, why did that happen, right? And what, how did I, how did I react to it or, or cause it or whatever, just analyze it and understand. And this is something that I, I really preach is in the, and it's not me, this came from someone else. I'm, this is, there are no new lessons we're just regurgitating things with different words, right? But stuff doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, right? And mm -hmm. so if you really see that everything that happens in a day happens for you, and then at the end of the day, or when you can take a pause and you really look back at it and say, well, I don't see how this happened for me. It really feels like it happened to me and dive into figuring that piece out. So it's that kind of a, a thing in that practice, at least something I've tried to, to make a practice becomes easier and easier. The more you do it, just like any muscle, just like any exercise, the more you do it, the more it becomes a uh, second nature to analyze and pay attention, right? Obstacles, trials, trauma, all of that is just cleverly disguised opportunity. It, it really is. And if we, we look at people constantly and we say this, I hear this all the time, like so-and-so started way down here and whatever the situation was and had this bad thing happen, this bad thing happened, this bad thing happened. And despite all odds became this amazing person, right? And, and like, no, it's not despite all odds. It's because of all odds. It's mm. because of those odds they became that amazing person. You take those things away from them, and you just took away all those opportunities. Those opportunities to overcome, those opportunities to become this amazing. Because you don't become, you don't just all of a sudden become this powerful person, right? That, that is a line upon line, precept on precept type thing. You learn a little, you grow from that, you stretch yourself, you do it again, you do it again, and you pay attention and you analyze backwards. And I, I, I'm not saying I got it all figured out, but that's what I do. And that's what's helped me. And that's what these, all these crazy experiences, experiences, it's spelled with an S now, um, all these crazy experiences that you see in the book or read about in the book or hear about, it's on audio now, or hear about in the book, there's, there's learning that comes from that. There's growth that comes from that. Um, and even putting it down on paper and becoming an, an author, which I never thought I was going to do, there was a lot of growth that came from doing that. And as you said before, and thank you for sharing, you know, sharing all of the, um, all of your learnings to, to try and help others, uh, the opportunities you had to learn. And again, I think it speaks to this mindset. Let's, let's go back a, a couple minutes with what you said. It's having that mindset that things are happening for us rather than happening to us. And as, as we take the opportunity to look backwards and reflect and analyze what happened today, if something feels like it happened to us, to really dive into that. That's a powerful sentence, man. Yeah, and it's a good practice to get into. I, every day at the end of the day, I try to do that. And I also try to identify three things that I was grateful for that day. And, and why? Always put the why. Always put the why, because that's the cement. I mean, that's what glues it in there, right? Yeah. So, and I do that with my son too, and, and, and it's starting to work, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in the, when you're in this, this training and, and subsequent uh, deployment, you, you detail a quite a challenging personal issues with, with family, with your, your wife at the time, right? And, and it brings up uh, for me, the question of compartmentalizing and it's a complex topic compartmentalizing. And I do wonder if there's a way you can help us kind of put it in a good context of how we should or shouldn't use this. When we go to work, we most of us go, go to work either for me at home most days or others in an office. Um, we're not faced with the life and death that you've detailed. And so I can see how compartmentalizing is maybe a necessity to get through certain missions, to have a mindset of getting through deployment. I'm really curious, looking back based on your experiences, what are your thoughts on compartmentalizing? Uh, you know, compartmentalizing can get a bad stigma, but I think there's a time and a place for it. 
and and I think the reason that it gets a bad name is if we compartmentalize and never deal with what we compartmentalized, then it becomes a festering wound, being gang gangrenous, spiritually gangrenous, emotionally gangrenous, whatever you want to call it. But but compartmentalizing in a healthy way, I think, is a necessity, a tool that we have to have in our toolkit because every person that's listening to this podcast has multiple facets to their life. And so at one, any one point, one of those facets is going to have something significant happening that can bleed over and negatively affect all the other facets of their life, right? Usually that happens only 100% of the time, right? So, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so what you, you, you either compartmentalize it or you, you bring everything down with any time anything comes up in any one segment, right? With what in the book, you're right. I I I I emphasize even in the book that sometimes that it was much more difficult to deal with the relationship than it was to deal with the trauma I was experiencing with life and death situations. And so, people that don't experience life and death situations, what I'm trying to give them there is understanding that trauma is trauma, pain is pain, and there we don't do we don't do pain comparison, right? Yeah, because your pain is greater than my pain, your traumas. I can't judge that. I can, absolutely cannot. But I can say, as a matter of fact, in my life, that some of the most painful things have happened from situations that had nothing to do with war, right? And so that gives credit and weight to people that have never experienced those horrific things that, that, we're, that are in the book. Like, holy crap, maybe this really is something I need to deal with. This is something I need to uh compartmentalize at a time right and so put it in a box and deal with it so that you don't derail your whole life but understand that when you put it in that box you have to go back to that box mm -hmm. and, and and deal with it right and you have to deal with it in, in in a healthy way not just let it blow up because it will blow up into your other boxes right um and then you just got turds in every box and that's no good right yeah and i think i i really appreciate the context you're bringing to this as with most things, uh, they don't exist on an island. They're not a right or wrong 100% of the time, of course, right? And so you're talking about, I'm sure we're many of us, we're all compartmentalizing every day and don't even realize it actually most of the time, to your point, right? Um, we have a lot of different facets of our lives, and um, we need to minimize certain things in certain contexts to move forward in a different context. But the key you're saying there is to not put that away permanently and make sure that you revisit it. Every time you throw something in a box, think of it as an anchor. There is an anchor there, right? And if you don't go back to that anchor, it's just going to hold your whole, your whole system, your whole life back. Right. So you have to release that anchor. That's okay to throw the anchor there because what you're doing is saying, I got to come back to this, right? I have this, I'm going to put it over here right now because I have other stuff I got to focus on right now. So I'm throwing that anchor out. And anchors hold things in place, right? Mm -hmm. Which is good because you want to go back to that. But if you just throw the anchor and never go back to it, it's going to hold your whole ship, right? Not just that one thing. So, yeah, thanks for saying that. And and I also I have written this quote down from the book, um, which you've kind of already spoken to. Uh, I, I quote: "There are actually more similarities between my war experiences and yours than most realize." And you've already kind of addressed that in like comparative suffering does us no good. Oh, I'm going through a difficult trauma. Oh, yeah. but it's it's not as bad as being in a an Apache 64 and being shot at. Oh, okay, I don't need to deal. Uh, it's tough enough, Jason. Right. Yeah. So I I do actually really appreciate you bringing that perspective to this conversation for everybody. It's like, hey, take a look. Some things are really tough. Okay, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. And there's two sides to that coin. Um, I agree. Like. You really need to give give it the weight that it needs, but at the same time, it, it as a perspective tool, at least for me, it is always always helpful for me to say, "There's people that have it way worse than I do," mm -hmm. right? And that and because that's always true. Like, yeah, it is. I don't care how bad you have it; somebody has it worse. You're not going to compare it in a way to say, "I'm not going to deal with my stuff." So, in that facet, pain is pain, trauma is trauma. You need to deal with it. You need to. You need to engage it and not minimize it because if it's affecting you negatively it's powerful we can all agree that trauma is powerful right because um it, it it actually will drive people to take their own life that I, I i think is the the most powerful thing you could possibly do right yeah. so there's a lot of power 
in trauma. But that's both good and bad. Power is where you direct it, right? So I always use the analogy of a lightning bolt. A lightning bolt, if it hits you square on the top of the head, you're probably dead. But if you redirect that energy, it can power a city. Trauma, if used as a foundational tool, can be under your feet, lifting you up to the best version of who you can be. It can actually be your superpower because you experience those things. What do we say? Not to you, for you. So once you identify where that for you is and how that for you is, what was the lesson? How did that make you a better, how can that make you a better person? If it didn't yet, make sure you retool that so where we can. And that's a training that we actually put together from this book to do, to teach people how to turn their trauma to triumph. Um, that's wonderful. And and honestly, it can become foundational. It can be that redirected lightning bolt because it is powerful. And I don't care if it's, man, when I first got in the, and some of those guys were like, I have PTSD. And of course we did that whole you know, comparison. Like, how can you have PTSD? You're not even getting shot at, right? But some of them really did. And and what I've learned through this book and through other processes is, is, is exactly what we've said over and over again already on this podcast is pain is pain and trauma is trauma. And you, if it's affecting you negatively, you need to focus on it. Redirect that power, digest it to your benefit and move forward. Be cleared hot on your life. You seem to be a master at threading the needle, Brian. I mean, you're talking about there is value in seeing the perspective of what you're going through compared to someone else. And therefore the perspective element of that which is, we're going to get to your list of principles. We're kind of incidentally getting to your principles, which uh, is not a surprise, I suppose. But the perspective is valuable, but you don't use that to minimize the the anchor that you, you to ignore the anchor that you put down. So right. uh, wonderful. No, thanks for saying all that. There is a term that I was not familiar with, um, and it's called chair flying. <laughs> and um, you detail it in the book, uh, during some of the experiences you have in the, your deployment, as well as later at the end of the book, as you're trying to kind of express these different principles of how to handle trauma. Could you walk us through what chair flying is and how we can use it to our advantage? Um, no, so it's actually a tool that they teach us in flight school and they use the term chair flying, but what they teach us is just visualize, you know, scenarios and walk through it. And, and what I did is I took their term and just, put some steroids in it. And so basically my version of chair flying is if you, if you took um, meditation, visualization, role playing, got them together, they had a love child, that would be the chair flying, right? Okay. And it, it came about for me because I kept having emergencies. <laughs> like things kept happening it, early on, even in flight school, like aircraft were breaking and I had to like land without crashing. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, there's, yeah. and I say, I think I say in the book, I can't tap my helmet and say, coach, take me out. If you're in the air, you either fix it or you're done. Right. And that's, that's, that's just it. And so the first couple of events that I had like that, I was like, holy crap. Well, I made it through those, but you know, what if this happens? Right. And I can sit there and get anxious about the what if and get all anxiety, but that doesn't help anybody. Right. So what we start, I started to do is the process of, of chair flying. And for me, I would do, I would start by setting, by fertilizing my garden, I guess, because you want to plant some things that are going to grow. So I would meditate and, and meditation is individuals, fingerprints to figure out what works for you. For me, it's breathing exercises, right? So I would just do some breathing exercises. All that's telling your body, your brain, your soul is that you control the environment, right? That you are in control of the space. And then you start to visualize. Let's go to that incident where you're talking about with um, my co-pilot got shot. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to try to teach this principle through that. As, as we're rolling in, we're getting, we haven't engaged with the enemy yet. We're talking to the guys on the ground. We're trying to figure out where they're at so that we can get the cleared hot, right? Meet the criteria so that we can move forth with employing lethal ordinance. Just as we're starting to turn inbound, we get cleared hot. We get you're cleared on this azimuth, da, 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 clear to engage. We're rolling. I'm in a bank. And all of a sudden, my co-pilot starts screaming. I lose. Uh, he starts screaming, saying he's shot. It's very obvious because, I mean, if you hear, the, if you listen to the audio on that video, you'll, you'll, <laughs> you know exactly what happened right when it happened. So it would be easy to say that's the number one priority, but it wasn't. It was number three on the priority list at that moment because at the same time, an engine got shot out. And in the background of that video, and you hear him screaming, you also hear this, 
wrote RPM low. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This really calm voice telling me that I'm about to die, right? So yeah. rotor is what keeps us flying. So when it's low, we're falling. And the cyclic, which is the control in my right hand that's between my legs, which controls right, left, bank, was jammed. Um, so I, w- I went to roll out and drop the, the collective, which is the control on my left hand, makes us go up and down. And counterintuitively, when you have low R- rotor RPM, rather than pull up to make it go up, you need to slam it down. And it reduces the, the angle of attack in the blade so that the induced flow of air, this is all science sorry, push your glasses back and go, eh, here we go. So as, as we're falling, the induced air spins it faster, it creates inertia, and hopefully you have enough to, to gain, uh, to, to keep it spinning fast enough to apply. Well, I dumped the collective at the same time and I went to control, I went to center up the, the, the cyclic in, my, the, in the, the control between my legs, but it was jammed. So we're falling at a, what we call a slice sideways towards the ground. Hmm. And in the Apache, there is a backup control system, but you have to sever the mechanical linkage to get to the backup control system. I know this because we, we learn it, right? So I, I know that's what I have to do. And so I slam that cyclic. It's a certain, I can't remember how many pounds of pressure to break the mechanical linkage. It's designed to break. So it's not like you have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to do it, but you do have to give it some assertive pressure. And then there's this, they call it a one second easy on, right? A one second easy on where there's one second where it doesn't take effect of where the cyclic was. When I learned that, I was like, okay, I didn't think much of it. In this moment, I realized exactly why that one second easy on was there because what I had to do with the controls, had it taken immediate effect with the engine power limited, we probably would have landed upside down in front of the Taliban. And that is not how you like to land, right? So so when I slammed it over, he screams, and I'll tell you why in a second, he screams again, slams it over, it does break. I remember thinking, please work as advertised Boeing one second because I don't want to fall upside down. And I bring it back to the center. It does take effect. The, the rotor comes back. So those were priorities. One, two. Now I can talk to my yeah. co-pilot, right? All that happened in, uh, what, a second, you yeah. know? And and he screamed because what we found out later is his leg was shot, shattered his femur, wrapped it around the cyclic, and that's why it was jammed. So when I slammed it out, it unspun his leg, which obviously mm-hmm. hurt. And then it came all the way to the other side. He had a bruise that looked exactly like a cyclic on his other leg because I hit it. And then it came back to center. Why I tell that story, besides it's just kind of a crazy story. Okay, I just explained all kinds of stuff, right, that was happening. If I had to think about all that stuff, like just like I'm going to sit down and think about what I'm going to do today, I wouldn't have had enough time. We'd have been yeah. done, right? Yeah. And so in chair flying, I would visualize what, what's going to happen if I lose an engine, right? And I'm in a bank, right? And so I would, I would work myself up to what I call a choke point. First, I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do this. If I pause, then that tells me my brain hasn't, hasn't connected that dot yet, right? Hmm. If I pause, that's a choke point. Then we're going to work through that choke point, go back to the start and do it again, right? Until we go right through that smoothly and we hit the next choke point. We do that again and again and again. Can you, you can go start to finish, no choke points. It's already been it's been mapped. It's been wired. We got it, right? Now we're going to throw variables in there. Yeah. We're going to throw, well, what if it doesn't work like it's supposed to? And then this happens, right? And what if this happens? And then and then we're and we're not doing this to induce anxiety. And I, and I know a lot of people will be like, well, man, if you're thinking about it, well, what ifs, you're going to get, no, that's the meditation piece. We planted, okay. we, we fertilized our garden, right? If you start to go to that anxiety level, you go back to step one. I'm in control of this day. And then you try to get further than you did last time, right? Maybe you don't get all the way through it in one sitting or two sittings or three sittings or four sittings, but keep working it and keep controlling the space and you'll get there. The moment, if you start getting anxiety, you, you got to go back to step one, right? I'm not a real anxious person, so I never really dealt with that, but I have had people that are, and we've used this technique. And they just have to go through it more, more times, right? They just have to go back and it, and it works. And you can use this in, in your daily life as well. But then you go to the role play part of the chair flying, right? So I did it all the visual gymnastics. Now I'm actually saying and doing and moving and putting muscle memory to the actions, moving my hands how I want to do it. 
am I going to, I'm going to be calm on the radio. I'm going to take a deep breath real quick. Take all the time you need. You got half a second, quick breath. Right. And, and then I'm going to sit, I'm going to talk calm. And if you did listen to that, I'm pretty calm on the radio. Like it's just now, does that mean my heart wasn't going 5,000 beats a minute? No. It, it, I mean, I had a hummingbird in there, but, but outwardly and control wise, it was all calm, cool, collected, and even throwing jokes out there. Right. So those are all things that were run through the chair flying process. And once you put that role play piece to it, the muscle memory, it's been mapped. Now your muscles know what to do. Did I ever, did I ever chair fly that exact scenario where he got his leg shot it wrapped around the cyclic and, and, you know, um, I had to break in the backup control. We're flying with engine shot out. No, I didn't. Right. I didn't. Now, did I chair fly all of those scenarios individually? Yes. Did I chair fly compound emergencies? Yes. In different ways? Yes. You put enough of those little things together and your brain will connect it quickly. Yeah. Right. So that's what chair flying is. Now, the, the, the added benefit to it that I did not know I was doing at the time, but when I got back and talked to all the people with three letters behind their names that were smarter about brain stuff than me, <laughs> three letters behind their <laughs> right? <laughs> so when I talked to those dudes, they're like, it's, you were doing stress inoculation, right? And I'm like, oh, well, well that, what's that? And, you know, well, we know what inoculation is. It, you give yourself a weakened dose of a vaccine, of a, of a virus. Yeah. Yeah, and your body builds up a, a tolerance to that virus, and then when the real virus comes knocking, you punch it in the face. That's what I was doing with trauma. Like, I I pictured blowing people up before I saw them be blown up by my trigger. I pictured it ahead of time. Mm. My brain had already digested that to some extent. Now it wasn't exactly how I pictured it because you can imagine a war, you can imagine a fight. No matter what you imagine, you will not be right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I imagined wasn't perfect, but it did inoculate myself somewhat to that situation. So when, in, when trauma came knocking, I could punch it in the face, right? And say, get underneath my feet, your foundation, or you're not an obstacle, right? So, so that was something that was happening without realizing it was happening. Um, and then it was, it was to that part that we just talked about, analyze afterward, take the patients, look back and see the lessons, talk to the guys with three letters behind their name and say, why? And learn from it. And so, it's a technique you can use every day because if you're going to have a difficult conversation with your significant other, there's a lot of choke points, <laughs> you know, and if you can work through as many of those choke points ahead of time, they're going to happen in real time because you already got it, right? You got to handle it perfectly, but you can definitely control your side of the scenario much better, which often will have ripple effects to the other side of the scenario. Thanks for taking the time to go through that whole piece deliberately, you know, painting the picture of the experience uh, with your co-pilot and how that's the third. <laughs> it did blow my mind reading. Uh, my co-pilot is shot. That's priority three. I understand it. Right. But just just saying that is fascinating. And then hearing the backstory, the preparation, determining the outcome. Like you said, it's not about robustly handling every possible permutation that could ever have happened in your life, but you practiced this combination of meditation, visual, visualization, and role-playing, and the fact that you're anticipating and experiencing what that could be like in certain ways is stress inoculation. I find that fascinating. And as you just said, let's even take it to, to the business angle here for a second. Everyone who works on a team or works with other people mm -hmm. has that person who yeah. they don't get along with. And we can go out there today and have the same dang argument again. And we can handle ourselves the exact same way again, which will have the same poor result again. But all of those things emotionally for us do happen in that one second, mm -hmm. right? Our coworker says that thing that triggers us, boom, boom. we're done. Mm -hmm. It's that one second you had in the air in the airplane is uh, sorry helicopter as well. We could chair fly, take ownership of ourselves to improve what is in our control, and come to that relationship with a stronger presence, with a more prepared uh, presence. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was you that just posted something that said that you have more uh, more effect on someone's stress as a as a leader, a boss, or manager than a significant other at times, right? Yep. Even even as subordinates, if you're working hand in hand with somebody, we have a lot of connection with people that we work with, and a lot of effect on their overall mental health, right? And, and our over our yeah, no health, doubt, right? And I agree with you 100. percent Like, except for well, not 100. percent You said they have the same thing, the same result. No, it gets worse. It builds. Okay. It builds. That's fair, right? We don't ever. Do, it doesn't just. It doesn't just stay the same level. That that if we don't deal with it, it builds and builds and builds and eventually will unravel. It's something. that box. It's that anchor, and it's compounding. Yes, hundred. It's getting gangrenous. The principles, um, and you said this earlier, you talked to, what is it? You talked to people who had three letters after the name. Okay, so people smarter <laughs> than you and me, uh, who who you asked why. Why did I handle this trauma a certain way where maybe other folks didn't handle it uh, the same way? And we're talking about a distinction be- between ha- growing from certain things that are stressful and traumatic versus uh, experiencing more towards the damage end of things you said, right? Yeah. And here are seven principles in your book that you pointed out why it was more likely you would experience post-traumatic stress growth. And it was practice chair pile. What? Practice chair flying. There we go. That's the <laughs> real word. You can pile too. Yeah. <laughs> practice chair flying, which we just talked through uh, quite vividly. Thank you for that. Another is build perspective. Third, believe in a higher cause. Fourth, be part of a team. Fifth, let the wound breathe by debriefing. Six, don't harbor hate. And seven, define and embrace honorable missions. What I wanted to do is give you a chance, if there's anything we haven't hit today in this discussion, is there anything in those seven principles that you just really, really want to make sure to express? Each of those principles has you know techniques that we we go kind of like chair flying that we go that i that i teach and go into because i mean it's a course in and of itself each one of them right seems simple you know build a perspective be positive well duh you know yeah. everybody every, you know every or don't harbor hate yeah of course that makes sense how many how many of us do though how many of us have this little thing that just like when like you just talked about it in the workplace somebody says something that triggers there's a little hate there right there's a little hate there that causes that. Define your honorable mission. You know, um, what does that mean? That means that you are embodying what your, your what your cause is. You understand your cause is important. If your cause is important, then collateral damage or things that happen along the way are seen as just like things that you have to deal with to get to your mission, right? Because it's it's important. It's honorable. And one that I really I think is important is perspective. We talked about it a little bit. And the story that I use, and I've used it on other podcasts and we'll use it on future podcasts, but um, is when I first got to Afghanistan, um, I'd never been to war before, right? I was 20, I don't know, 7, 28, 28 years old, never been to war, didn't know what to expect. I was actually part of the advanced party, meaning there was three of us that got on a C-17 with our eight Apaches and flew in. And we were supposed to, you know, get them out, get them started, set up the, get, get, get the logistics part of it rolling. So when the rest of the main body showed up, they just had a checklist. We'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Here we go. So how I got selected to go do that as somebody who'd never been to war doesn't make any sense to me, but there really were very few people in our unit that had been. So there were the two sergeants that were with me were just the best maintainers we had and they'd never been to war either. So when we landed in the more early morning of, 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 in, sorry, when we landed in the early morning in Bagram, the back of the C-17 starts to open. It's early morning, so there is light. So it starts to, you know, it's like that movie where ah, it's light. And I can't see either. what's going to be, you know, there's like music behind you going, oh, you know. And the first thing that sticks out to me is it didn't stink, right? I didn't know that I thought it was going to stink, but I just, in the back of my head, I think, I think because it was war, I was like, it's going to be stinky, you know? And as it continued to go down and my eyes started to adjust, what did I see? I see mountains with snow on them and they're beautiful, right? And I'm like, we just land back in Utah? What the (laughs) heck? You know, like, so it kind of took me by surprise. The next thing you know, I'm flying missions over these mountains. And I'm like, man, that's a great snowboarding run right there. I can take it to, you know, you know, and, and, and it's beautiful. 
And, and it was really kind of eye-opening to where in a country where so much ugliness is happening, there's this extreme beauty. And then, we, and then to, to really polarize that, we get called on a troops and contact mission, which is tick, a tick call. And we, we call it patchy in the area. We're taking fire. We need your help. Uh, you know, suppress the enemy at a one, two, zero, 300 meters. What? Yeah. So we descend out of that beauty and into the gunfight. And we hear the guy on the radio. And the guy on the radio is entrenched in that gunfight. That is all he sees. That is all that's important to him at that moment. That is his reality. That's it. The gunfight. As we get into it, it becomes our reality. Those mountains are long gone. It's just the gunfight. We are in that gunfight. We are throwing lead at people who are throwing lead at us. We are keeping their heads down to not throw lead at the guys on the ground. We are trying to do our honorable mission, right? But that is all that we are focused on is the gunfight. And in the midst of that gunfight, those mountains never changed. That beauty that was there never went anywhere. It is permanent, it is infinite, the gunfight is finite. The gunfight feels infinite in its moment. It feels like this is where we are. This is all that's important. And to some extent it is like you, that you do have to be front sight focused at that moment. But you also have to remain somewhere in the back of your head. You have to understand that this is finite because how many times in our lives are we stuck in gunfights and we treat them like they are the mountains, hmm. right? We treat them as if they are permanent, as if they are the bigger picture, when they are, in fact, a gunfight. And sometimes we choose to stay in a gunfight when we don't need to. We just stick in that gunfight. <clears throat> the gunfight's over. We're still throwing rounds. The guys are gone. We're still in that gunfight. Like That's a perspective thing. You get to those mountains, and you raise up even further, higher perspective, if you will, and you start to see the curvature of the earth. And it's beautiful in every direction. That's infinite. That's not going anywhere. If you raise up even further and you see the globe and you're in space, I've never done this, but helicopters don't fly that high. But you're in space and you see clouds and water and land masses and beauty. And guess what? The beauty is not in every direction because there is no direction. It just is. The beauty just is. And that is the infinite. That is not going anywhere. On that very same time, when you're staring at that planet, if you were up in space, how many gunfights are happening on that planet at that time? How many gunfights are happening right now when we're talking about this message? How many gunfights are in your background of your head while we're talking about this message? And I'm not saying you can't have gunfights. You're going to. You have to. It's part of what we do but you have to keep them in perspective. You have to understand that they are finite and the infinite is beauty and always will be. And you have a right to that beauty, right? So there's an exercise that I'll walk through people. How do we build that perspective muscle, if you will, in our mind? And, and it, it, it really is through doing little exercises. And then those little exercises become habits. And then those habits become big muscles, right? And it becomes a default. And so put in the work to do that. I mean, we, I go on the techniques on how to do that, but it's totally worth it. And I don't have it nailed. I don't have it nailed. There's still times where I'm like, man, I just totally got focused. I just got focused on a gunfight. I had this, I had this discussion with my kid last week. Like, and I'm like, how am I going to teach him this? I'm like, well, I'm just going to teach him the way I teach anybody else. And I talked to him about gunfights and mountains. And now he identifies his mountains every time before he goes to school because he has somebody who's he's dealing with. And I said, I want you to focus on your mountains because that's a gunfight. When he says something, you know it's a gunfight. Go to your mountain. And mm -hmm. so he's been doing that. And it's been working. I asked him, I said, what happened today? Well, someone did this today, and I knew it was a gunfight. So I went to my mountain. Wow. I was like, okay, good. Helping to build that habit. So yeah. Build that muscle. Well, thanks for sharing that, Brian. That's great. And, and we can feel the passion for... Uh, the perspective uh, principle through your description and your explanation there. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, and, and above all, thank you for sharing uh, the book with us and for, um, as you said, uh, sharing the lessons that you've learned 
with others. And thank you. Sorry, I should have said this up top. Thank you for your service as well. Mark is worth it. The question I ask every single person on this podcast is the same at the end. Um, before I give you a chance to pitch wherever you want to direct people to check your stuff out. Uh, I ask everyone on this on the show, what is something you've learned recently? Well, I think I just hit it. Um, that the stuff I the stuff I teach grown men applies to kids too. And there's and there's a, and I I have I've already already had a strong desire to get upstream on some of this stuff. So we have some initiatives where we are we are reaching to the youth. In fact, to try to speak at colleges and stuff. I guess what I learned is always look at the tool set you've been given and don't don't be afraid to use it in different places. Here's my kids struggling with something. And I, in my head, I have this tool set that I talk to military people about or leaders about or corporate about, or it, these, this is, that's who I, that's my audience, right? And my own kid needs that message, right? And I have the tool set. And I was like, what? And, and, and it was weird. It was like, for a minute, I'm like, how am I going to help him with this? And I'm like, we have the tools, yeah. you know? And so, and it worked, go figure, you know, and, and, and I think how often does that happen in our lives where we have the answers, we just choose to think we don't, you know, yeah. and I always tell people, this is what I, t I tell people, you're not broken. I, I don't care who tells you, you are broken and how much you feel you are broken. That is a perspective thing. And that is what you've learned. And that is just swallowing the lightning bolt redirect that energy redirect that energy and i'm not saying that's easy i'm not saying oh it's just a simple no not i'm not i'm not diminishing your, your your struggles they're real they can serve to be your benefit it just takes some time and and, and that's what we do now you know we, we, we do a transformation training to try to help people and it's called trauma to triumph and and that's what we do we we take guys and there's it's a three-day container training and i can't tell you how many people have told me that that was well I, I can it's not an infinite number but a lot of people have come through and told me uh, this was my last step before I decided to suck start a nine millimeter right and now it's now it's a whole different perspective right and and a year after they're still in that good place so it really does work and and uh so that's been very rewarding for me that's great and for those listening who are interested in uh, either the the tools you're talking about or or the, the books, the materials, however you want to think about it, uh, where should they go to check it out? Well, I think right now the best way to do it is reach out to me on socials. And then I'm Brian Slade on on, on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. And um, But clearedhot.info is my website for the book. You could always hit me on the socials. You can also hit me at brian at clearedhot.info in an email. Um, and especially if you're interested in any of the trauma and triumph stuff, because I, I, I talk to people individually on that stuff. There's only so many seats. So as we, as we talk to people, um, we, we try to get, you know, get it lined out, but those would be the best ways to get a hold of me. And please do, you know, I mean, if this right. touched you in some way, you don't have to be military. You don't have to be first responder. You don't have to be any of that stuff. You just, if this was like connected, then, then reach out. Excellent. So Brian at clearedhot.info for the trauma to triumph. Uh, the website is clearedhot.info and uh, Brian Slade on social. I'll have all that in the social in the uh, episode notes. So perfect. Brian Slade, my uh, honor to speak with you today. Thanks again for sharing uh, what you've learned throughout your time thus far, and you will continue learning. Uh, but the, the pleasure has been mine for this conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. There you have it. Uh, my conversation with Brian Slade, the co-author of Cleared Hot. I, uh, before I do the summary of the episode, reminder, leadership.voyage is the website. You can contact me directly, startyourvoyage at gmail.com. If you are a new listener, please click that subscribe button wherever you're listening to podcasts. And if you've been listening for a while, I'd love it if you would rate and review the podcast. It helps 
all of this content reach others who are looking to build their leadership skills. So what did we talk about today with Brian? What a unique conversation. For those of you who have been listening to the podcast, it's not like any other I've had thus far, without a doubt. So uh, Cleared Hot is the book. It's also on audiobook. Within the last couple of weeks, it's launched there. Brian does the reading himself. Um, Cleared Hot, what does it mean? It means that we are cleared to move decisively with action in our own lives. It's important in Brian's estimation to find levity amidst the seriousness of situations. And he wrote this book because, in his words, he had a disparity of opportunity. He had all of these uh, opportunities to learn from the situations he went through and wanted to pass that along. We talked about the value of diversity in the process of writing this book and elsewhere. Uh, He used the metaphor of concrete uh, as a foundation When it comes to teams, people have to be working together for a common cause. There has to be a synergy there. But above all, camaraderie was the main point under that topic. How do you go about learning? First of all, you have to be looking for it. You have to be paying attention. You have to stop and analyze what happened. Brian said, stuff doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. And going through this process of learning, it's like building a muscle. Obstacles are cleverly disguised opportunities. Talking about compartmentalizing, as Brian said, trauma is trauma. We don't need to compare each other's traumas. It's not an award. It's not a race. We need to do certain types of compartmentalizing in order to move forward so we don't derail our lives. But we also have to remember We have to go back to deal with the things that we put in those boxes. And of course, we talked about trauma in a lot of different situations. That's really the crux of of this whole conversation is how to prepare for it or what to do with it. Brian used the metaphor of uh, lightning, saying that trauma can be very powerful uh, when redirected. Then we talked about chair flying which is very interesting. It's method of, for Brian at least, and, and we, I don't know since I haven't seen his workshops, but as far as for his own version of chair flying, it's this combination of meditation, visualization, and role playing where you take control of the environment and you go through the role play. Uh, if, you, if you hit anxiety or you feel like you're, stressed or you can't fire on all cylinders and connect the dots in your brain, you you go back to the beginning and you reestablish that environmental control, which he does through uh, meditation. And what he learned, which is really the whole reason that he wrote this book uh, in my interpretation, what he learned is there's the added benefit of going through this process of chair flying, which is stress inoculation. And that can minimize the damage that trauma has on us. We also talked about perspective, and we could hear Brian was very passionate about keeping perspective. He identified gunfights versus mountains, how gunfights are, in his words, finite moments. And the beauty of the mountains is infinite. Sometimes it's hard to recognize that the Gunfights are finite, but it's important to try to keep those gunfights in perspective. So that wraps up the notes from today's show with Brian Slade. Thank you so much for listening, and everyone take care.